All right, welcome everybody to this week's Net DevOps Live. Joining us today is Kevin Corbin, and he will be introducing us to Cisco NSO and how it acts as that single API and CLI for your entire network. It, during the entire session, we will be monitoring question and answer in the Q&A panel. So if you've got questions, feel free to drop them in there. And as always, all of the resources, slides, links, um, sample sandboxes and code are all posted up on Net DevOps Live with the webinar resources for this episode. With that, I'll hand it over to Kevin and he can get started. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. My name is Kevin Corbin, and today we're going to give you an introduction to the Network Services Orchestrator, which can be the single API and CLI for your network. Uh, so diving right in, what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about a brief history of TLF. I think the, the story of how NSO came to be a Cisco product is a good one relative to the discussions that we have with automation and orchestration, uh, give you a brief introduction to what NSO actually is, and then most importantly, we're gonna show you through demos how NSO can be that single CLI and API, and how it solves common configuration and automation challenges that we see in our customer base. <clears throat> so a brief history of TailF. TailF was an acquisition that Cisco made in I think the 2012 timeframe, and what they had done was, was rather interesting, and so let's kind of walk through it. And, and to do so, I'm going to take you on a brief tour of the sausage factory about how network devices are made and how the industry is responding to the desire for modern interfaces uh, on those network devices. So when you're designing a network device, kind of step by step, you start off and you make some hardware choices about you know, what this, the, the equipment's gonna look like, how many ports, how many interfaces, those sorts of things. And then on top of that, you lay an operating system down. Now, historically, there's been some choices here, but generally speaking now, the industry has moved to where almost every network device that you're gonna be deploying is gonna have some sort of a Linux operating system based on top of it. On top of that operating system, then the network vendors are responsible for creating these user land applications. Things like how do I manage interfaces? Uh, what does my BGP process look like? How am I interfacing with the data plane aspects of it and programming line cards or uh, updating forwarding tables? Other daemons like OLDP or DHCP server. And you can imagine in, in a relatively simple network device, there could be hundreds of these processes that are running, and then it's up to the equipment vendor to figure out how is the customer going to manage this with a SANE interface into the device. Specifically when the customers are asking for modern interfaces like NetConf or REST or SNMP or CLI interfaces, right? And so what TailF had done is in this not nice area is they, or this mystery layer area, they created a process that they call ConfD. And what ConfD did is it took these northbound agents, the interfaces, NetConf, REST, SNMP, et cetera, and this very messy southbound where you wanted to have a single endpoint for you know, configuring things like BGP, which may have a, a, you know, ramifications on the forwarding table, or we may need to flush some routing tables based on something that happens in the BGP process. And how do we turn them into model-based API and have transaction support so that these other southbound processes can subscribe to things uh, that are happening elsewhere in the system and then be able to react on that. TailF called this process, uh, or this, this package, ConfD. And if you want to experiment with ConfD, you're welcome to go out and download it and, and put a ConfD wrapper around any of your existing uh, Python scripts or some other things that you're doing. And what that will do is present this nice, clean NetConf, REST, SNMP, CLI, interface into your existing work. But they didn't stop there because they said, okay, now that we have the device level figured out, we sort of have the same problem where I have different device types, maybe a WAN router or a firewall or a router that's responsible for my data center interconnect versus top of rack or access switches. I also have Wi-Fi access points. And now my problem moves to instead of managing device level processes on a single box, I have kind of the same problem set managing things that have to touch multiple devices in a network topology. And we still have this desire to have a sane northbound interface uh, based on the, the operator's requirements. So once again, we have this mystery layer which says, how am I going to take an interface 
and, and manipulate the, you know, dozens or even hundreds of devices in, in a simple API or CLI configuration commands. What they were able to do though is say, hey, this is exactly the same problem. We have these many northbound agents, we have this kind of messy southbound, and we want to have a one-to-end mapping north to south, and there's a desire for still having model-based APIs with transaction support, and the ability for devices to subscribe to interesting events that may be happening elsewhere in the network. The ironic thing about this is that they were actually able to reuse most of the ConfD uh, code base and create the network orchestrator. So you have what they'll refer to as this homogenous orchestration environment where the devices that are being orchestrated are now running the ConfD process or ConfD daemon, which is in, in a lot of network uh, platforms, uh, most notably is the Cisco IOS XE platform. When we talk to you about NetConf or RESTConf support, uh, that's uh, in large part being provided by the fact that we're now running ConfD on the iOS XE devices, and there's also many other platforms from both Cisco and third parties that have opted to use that CompD interface, and now we have the ability to orchestrate it through a common code base, just moving the CompD process into the server side and being able to manage uh, uh, you know, multiple devices in a topology. And so it's there that we arrive at what is Cisco NS NSO, or the Network Services Orchestrator. The high level benefits that you're going to get are that it's going to be model driven and this is focused on end to end service lifecycle um, based on, on the devices that you have deployed in your network today. So because we're able to put this abstraction layer in there, we don't have a, a large uh, set of requirements for what those devices look like. Yes, it's better if they have NetConf, RESTConf or, or, or similar support. But in the case of older legacy devices, like maybe just your classic iOS device that doesn't have any of those modern interfaces, what we're able to do in the NSO architecture through this device abstraction layer that you see here is sort of run those processes server side so that we don't put a dependency on the network device itself and we can abstract maybe just an old CLI interface, but still on the northbound provide those modern NetConf or REST interfaces to it. We're also very much a third party device. Even though Cisco's made the acquisition of TLF, we are very much committed to maintaining uh, that, that other vendors that make your network equipment are first class citizens in this architecture. So, you know, we might have some iOS devices, some Juniper or Arista or other third party devices, and we're able to understand and communicate with those devices in this abstraction layer through what we call a NED or a network element driver. Uh, and that network element driver is responsible for both providing the model of what a device is capable of doing, as well as how to communicate it with it to the southbound, whether that be through CLI or a more modern interface. As we sort of move up the stack here, we have the next layer, which is called the device management layer. And we're gonna go through this extensively in the demos, uh, but what this layer allows us to do is to, you know, do your kind of mom and apple pie things like, check the, you know, collect the configuration off of all of the devices, audit against the way that those devices are configured, uh, um, and so on and so forth. We also have the, the notion of a package manager, and the package manager is, is like you would expect from any kind of Linux, uh, you know, package management solution, which basically says, how am I installing and managing the lifecycle of those NED packages for the southbound? as well as service packages to the northbound that describe what are the, the capabilities that we're offering from the network and exposed it via the, the, the northbound APIs. Uh, and then I, I alluded to it already, which is the service model layer or service management layer. And what the service management layer is, it's gonna be slightly out of scope for today's discussion, uh, but check back with us on future episodes and we'll talk at length about what service management brings to the table. But at a high level, it's the effect that says, hey, when we render a service to the southbound, there might be hundreds or, or thousands of lines of configuration or configuration changes that need to be made to various devices in my network. But from the user's perspective, I only need to collect, you know, maybe three or four or just a small subset of parameters that need to go in by which that I can make that rendering happen. And so 
at the heart of this is what's called the configuration database. And the configuration database is responsible for the translation of what are the input parameters to a given service, and then how do I dynamically render that down to the devices, again, with that abstraction layer to where I no longer have to care about CLI or REST or, or REST comp southbound to the device level themselves. And then most importantly, and what we're gonna focus on uh, through the remainder of today's session is these northbound interfaces. And so because these northbound interfaces are rendered from these models that, it, that, it, uh, that are present in the NSO system, they're gonna be very consistent. And I hope that's one of the key takeaways that you'll uh, uh, have from today's session, which is whether I'm using the CLI, the web UI, the REST interface, uh, those, those interfaces should look and feel as, as close as they possibly can, uh, given the fact that maybe we're just changing some transport underneath. <clears throat> And again, just to emphasize again, this is multi-vendor, multi-domain, um, and we're, what we're providing is kind of a centralized place where we can uh, advertise and catalog what are these capabilities that we have in the underlying network. And just one more kind of marketing slide here. As you can see, we, we do claim a, a very broad multi-vendor support. So you'll see a lot of usual suspects here in terms of other device types and manufacturers that we can interoperate with uh, both Cisco and non-Cisco uh, support. And these are supported through that NED or network equipment, or network element driver uh, package that we mentioned before. The other thing, since we're talking net DevOps and, and we're all starting to kind of get into this developer world, the other thing that I like to highlight here that NSO provides is a really great development environment, uh, as well as some SDK content that's provided. So as we start off creating our automation packages, one of the, the nice things that, that NSO provides is a dev local multi-vendor network simulator. So because the network element driver is a representation or a model of what the capabilities are of a device are, we're able to instantiate that model uh, and basically simulate any of the network devices that we support. So if I wanna have an iOS router, I can instantiate kind of a fake version of that router on my local laptop. Uh, the second thing that we allow is a full production grade installation in the dev environment. So not only am I recreating the devices that I wanna interact with as I'm testing out my automation, I'm also starting to, to take the actual management uh, uh, and the NSO components and replicate those locally in my dev environment. And of course, all of this is based off of, you know, Yang data models, which we've covered in other sessions. Uh, and those Yang tools are also incorporated in the, the NSO packaging as well. So I can do things like, you know, browse those Yang models, see what's available to me, or I can even create my own Yang models to represent services and automations uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, so both as we kind of move through this kind of um, continuum here, obviously in the verification phase, after we create this, you know, this dev local environment, we can, we can validate that any of our policies and things like that are able to, uh, 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 you know, to be ran without error, and we can do some offline validation prior to actually touching any uh, network environment. You know, we, we often joke that, um, uh, uh, you know, everybody has a, a test environment, and some customers are lucky enough to have a completely separate environment to run production in. Uh, and that's very much uh, the case in a lot of the customer environments we see. And NSO uh, definitely solves that problem through this notion of being able to replicate these production environments locally on a laptop without a, a, a good deal of resources behind it. Uh, and then the, the packaging of this, right? So as we release our services and our automation capabilities, those themselves are versioned uh, and those you know different iterations of a, of a you know, a VLAN might happen. And so we can represent that in terms of the packaged automation and what that would look like at the various stages in its life. And then also be able to manage the, the, the life cycle of those services as well to say, how do, I, how do I migrate from, you know, VLAN, which was the standard six months ago to now what a VLAN is that, that's our standard moving forward and, and how do we manage the, the migrations. So taking a step back from the product specific side of things here, 
we're going to talk just very generically about sort of the, the journey that we see customers going on uh, uh, in their automation endeavors, right? So it sort of starts with kind of the network engineering piece and we say, well, we want to automate some stuff because we have these error prone manual tasks, the uh, volume of requests that we're getting in is increasing at a pace which we haven't seen before. And now with virtualization, uh, you know, things that we used to be maybe, uh, uh, you know, something that we did a couple times a month, now we may be doing on a weekly or daily basis, which is like instantiating completely new devices, right? Before it would take me a long time to rack and stack the physical gear, but it only takes me a few minutes to stand up a new uh, virtual router or virtual switch. And so the volume in which I'm adding devices into my network is increasing as well as the changes that we want to make. When we move into sort of the operational side of the house, we, think, we, we, we have challenges where we say, okay, well, we want to be able to tell these services that we're providing, how well are they providing it, right? We've We've, we're still very much device centric in how we're auditing device configurations um, and making sure that we have the right quality of service implemented into the network. Um, and then as well as our architecture team, right, they're constant, there's some friction here because they're constantly wanting to evolve the network and offer new services and respond back to the business but they have to kind of go through the full life cycle circle of how do we get that through network engineering? How do we hand that off to the operations teams? What's the cost of those changes? And what are the tooling mechanisms that we're gonna put in place to make the engineering and operational teams' lives a little bit easier? And so the way that NSO uh, uh, kind of maps to this is that we, we take that same approach and say, okay, how would customers get started in this journey with NSO? And what we're going to focus on today is this kind of first aspect of it, which is on the network engineering and automation stage. And in stage one, what we advocate for is that we want to have this single network API. And we don't want to make assumptions about who the consumer of that API is going to be because different consumers may prefer different interfaces. If I'm a network engineer, maybe I really love the CLI and we want to provide a northbound interface that represents the entire network, but in a workflow that's consistent with how I'm used to doing my job. On the other hand, if I want to integrate in with an ITSM system, like say ServiceNow, I need to be able to provide the same capabilities from that CLI, but expose them as a northbound REST interface for my ITSM systems to integrate in with. And so in stage one here, that network API is what we're going to focus on uh, for the remainder. And as I mentioned before, stay tuned because we will have other episodes where we're going to build on the foundational capabilities that we discussed today and talk about how we get the service uh, insight and how we automate the, the top level services that we're providing into our business. And then ultimately, we want to show you guys how you go about developing your own service packages on top of NSO in a later phase as well. So let's double click a little bit on the network API, right? And, and what, what are the problems that we're trying to solve here? Everybody wants to automate their device configuration. We're using lots of various tools that are available in there. And, and the ultimate goal in automation is really to increase the quality of the product that we're delivering. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time kind of upfront figuring out how we best implement a configuration into a device and one of the key considerations in there is that we know that once that device configuration is in place, it's probably going to live there for a long time for a variety of reasons. And so there's a good deal of time spent trying to get it right and trying to see if, you know, what our crystal ball shows in the future because we're going to have this inflexibility to change it um, at least for a period of time or, or, or have some difficulty in getting the approvals necessary and the testing and validation redone to figure out how we um, uh, you know, modify or migrate that configuration. And, and the, the sort of state of the art in automation to date has still been CLI scripting, right? So we, you know, maybe tools like Python or, or some SSH libraries on top of that or Ansible or Puppet or Chef. And unfortunately, because of the devices, you know, the, the fleet that is installed in customer environments, that tends to still be very CLI centric. Uh, that has some downsides in terms of the, the failure rate and just what you can actually do for, uh, you know, desired characteristics like item potency and, and, and things of that nature. So how do we solve these? The first thing that we do is we provide this Yang-based configuration 
database. And so what that is, is it's going to be the single source of truth about how we want our network to be configured. Now, to operate or interact with that database, we have various operations that we can do. We can do something like a sync from, where I have an inventory of my devices that are already deployed and already have configuration on it. And I can instruct NSO to take those configurations and sync them into the configuration database and say, okay, now this brownfield environment is my network today and now I have a starting point for automation moving forward. As I move forward on this journey and we have that consolidated database that represents the desired state, the, the switch can sort of be thrown the other direction, which is instead of syncing from the devices, now my configuration database is the source of truth and I want to make sure that all of the devices are synchronized with what the configuration database says that they should be or what we would call a sync to operation. And again, from this configuration database, we render this rich set of northbound APIs that allow me to interact with that configuration database and then ultimately with the devices that it represents. That, those APIs are going to be both consistent, and, and again, I hope you'll see this from the demos today, that it's not a steep learning curve because of the consistency of what would the CLI command flow be versus what would the URL be that I would make a request using some sort of a REST client. Uh, and then also note that these are not just device level interfaces, but that these are network wide CLI or UI. So now I have a single CLI, single web UI, and a single REST API that represents my entire network. And what's really nice about this is again, we've given the choice of what interface you want back to the consumer itself. And a lot of customers will say, you know, we're really familiar with the CLI and it's great that you provide us now with one CLI so that I don't have to have 17 SSH windows open when I'm making my change. I can do that change all from one CLI and influence the configuration of multiple devices. But then over time, as we develop and mature operationally, we will want to start introducing these REST interfaces or, or NetConf interfaces northbound. And again, we still get the same configuration database that we're interacting with. And so we have some, trend, some uh, uh, benefits there of being able to um, sort of evolve uh, the, the technologies and the interfaces that we use. Regardless of which of the interfaces that, that I'm using, because we have a database in the picture now, we can start to introduce some other kind of database-centric concepts, things like transactions. So if I'm making a change which is going to impact 100 devices in my network, one of the things that I, I don't want to have to think about is what happens if it's successful on 95 of those devices but errors out on five of the devices. Because we're a database now, we have these transactions and transactions are what are said to be atomic, which means that all of the device configuration changes that are required are going to be made successfully or none of the changes are going to be made. So if we get into a scenario where we try to push a change out to those 100 devices, 95 of them are successful and five of them are unsuccessful, we can choose, or what, what, well, by default, we will automatically roll back the 95 devices that were changed based on the fact that some of them didn't go well. And this is a huge benefit as opposed to that CLI scripting that we talked about prior because now I don't have to think about what's my rollback plan. My rollback plan is provided for me uh, through the orchestration engine. But enough talking, let's get into some demos. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do here is I'm gonna switch over to my terminal window and I'm gonna make, I have a make file that's defined here and I'll just give a quick look at what that looks like. And it's just a shorthand for some you know, rather long commands that I don't want to try to type without uh, making any errors on a live WebEx. So I have a couple of make targets and the first one I'm going to do is make NetSim. And this is the network simulator that I talked about. Now the network simulator is taking those NED packages and instantiating a copy of that model using the ConfD processes. Now it is worth noting that these are not real devices. They don't have a control plane, they don't have a data plane, 
they, they just are a, a rendering of what the CLI or what the REST API would look like for that device with sanity checking to make sure that the configuration that I'm pushing is in line with the capabilities of those devices. And to give an example of that, I'm gonna just pop over here and, and log in to one of the devices, in this case, my NXOS device. And you can see I can do the commands that I'm sort of familiar with, which is you know, things like a show running config. But certainly if I were to go in and do something like a show interface, there's no interfaces here. Now, the good and the bad of that is, again, the, the bad is there's sort of no data plane. The good of this is that I can make up my module and port configurations to map with exactly what my production network is. So for the, the few customers that are lucky enough to have fairly robust lab capabilities, what you find a lot of times is that if I have a, you know, a Nexus 7000 with 18 slots full of line cards in my production environment, I may only get two or three of those line cards in my dev environment. Uh, and so you know, with those real devices, I can't do something like come in and say, configuration, interface, ethernet, 18 slash five, but in the case of the NetSim, because it understands that a Nexus device could in fact have a slot 18 and a port 5 on that, I can make configuration changes in here and go ahead and you know, do my normal configuration. This is you know, an interface in slot 18. You love my creativity. Uh, so I get some changes, right? And likewise, I can do the same thing over here. We can go in and look at our iOS device over here and you see it's you know more or less the same, a little bit different command structure, but this is in fact valid iOS configuration that we're testing against. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna do, so now that I have some devices for me to work with, the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to launch a local NSO instance. And this is setting up NSO directly on my laptop uh, such that I can have the same uh, uh, server side components that I would have running directly on my laptop, that I would have running in production, instead running directly on my laptop here. So I have a full uh, development environment for me to start to make changes with. Now the first thing that we're gonna show here is actually the web UI. And I'm gonna spend just a moment on the web UI, but since we're talking about because we're talking about automation and stuff, we're gonna quickly go back to the APIs here. But I just wanna show you uh, very quickly that in fact, this local instance now is, list, is spawning a web server and I can look at the devices that I have managed, uh, which is a nice little developer workflow deal where when I launch NSO and I also have NetSim components running, uh, NSO goes ahead and makes the assumption that because you're running NetSim and now launching NSO, it's very likely that you actually want those NetSim devices to be imported into your inventory. So it goes ahead and does that for you. Now, the first thing that I'm gonna do, so these are my existing network devices. The first thing that I'm gonna do is one of the operations that we talked about. I'm gonna do a sync from. I have an existing network out there and I wanna import all of the device configurations into the uh, configuration database. So now the configuration database represents what my source of truth is and, and how those devices are configured. One of the very early challenges that folks run into is as we're introducing network automation, how do I manage the rotation away from engineers and operational practices that are uh, you know, centered on going into a specific device and making changes? To, towards now we have a network orchestrator or a network automation platform and we wanna siphon or funnel all of those changes into that orchestration platform. So we get things like Hank, you will usually refer to as the cowboy engineering that tends to happen. And in cowboy engineering, what might happen is I might have somebody that comes in here and says, well, I need to add a new loop back for a device, which ends up being sort of the hello world of network programmability. And we're gonna say this is made out of band. And I can certainly uh, you know, now do the same operations from the web UI and do things like, uh, I need to commit this change real quick. Um, I can do things like check sync. 
to see are the devices now in synchronization with what that source of truth says it should be. In this case, for the NX1 device, it's telling me, no, it's not in, in, in uh, sync. There's some differences. To highlight those differences, I'm going to flip back to the CLI workflow now, and I'm going to show you the single CLI for my entire network. And so I, I've launched uh, the NCS CLI. I've passed it my username, and you'll notice this other minus C flag here. Because we're multi-vendor, we can't assume that everybody wants, you know, a iOS-like CLI, in which case I'm doing a show running config, very common com configuration command, but maybe I'm actually more of a Juniper shop, and I really would like to see this in a Juno-style CLI. Because again, because of this model driven approach that we've taken, we can represent that Yang based data store in whatever interface and whatever nuance of that interface, in this case, a Juniper style CLI as opposed to a Cisco CLI. Those are choices that we leave up to you as the consumer, right? Whichever one works best for you. Um, I happen to be uh, um, you know, fond of the Cisco style CLI, so I'm going to go ahead and switch back here. But getting back to our demonstration here, all of the workflow that we do here, I can do from the CLI as well. So I'm gonna do a devices check sync one more time, and we're gonna see that again, sure enough, that NX1 device is out of sync. Now, the next natural question that you might have is, well, what's, you know, what's the difference here? And for that, I can do a devices device NX1 compare config. And it's going to show me there's a loop back out here that has been added that this configuration database doesn't know about. Now, as the administrator, I have a choice to say, is this change a good change and was just made maybe not in the best manner? Or do I actually want to prevent these types of changes being made by external systems and external administrators? For the purposes of this demo, we're going to say that we're running the, you know, the hard line now that says our, uh, our orchestrator and our automation platform is the only way that device changes should be made and anything that's made out of band is a no-no, in which case we're going to do a devices device NX1 and this time I'm going to run the sync2 operation. And this is saying whatever's changed on the device that's not reflected in the configuration database, make the configuration database what's actually on the devices. And so in doing this, you'll see that we had a commit performed via SSH. And if I log back in here and, and try to do a show running config on that loopback, we're gonna see that there is in fact no more loopback five that was configured on this device. Now, so we've talked about what, ha what not to do, but now let's talk about what we actually would want somebody to do. As I mentioned, this is a CLI that should be very comfortable for most network engineers. And so when I'm looking at a device, I can do the same commands, although maybe a little bit of additional step here because now we're only in one CLI, so I need to tell it which device do I actually want to make a change to. So instead of just a show running config, I can say, show me the running config of my devices, and specifically, I want to see the running config of device NX1. And likewise, when I go into configuration mode, same workflow as I'm used to from working on a device level interface, and I can go into devices device NX1 uh, config, and now I'm in config mode for that device. Uh, so if we wanted to add our same loop back in again, we would do our device loop back, and this time I'm gonna do six, and we'll say the description, this change was made through NSO. Now, we talked briefly about transactions. Transactions are nice in that, again, they're all or nothing or atomic, right? And so while on a device level interface, this interface would have actually been configured in the description, you know, already updated on the interface and any other operations, whether I was adding BGP or taking a protocol away, those things would already be live on the device. Because I'm just interacting with the CDB, I don't actually have them live yet. But to do that, I can do a commit dry run and it's gonna show me what all of the changes that I made. I can also do a validate to say, have I violated any compliance rules? In this case, everything looks good, so I'm gonna go ahead and commit it. And you can see down below here, 
the device actually made a change and we can look at that change by doing a show running configuration and sure enough there's our loopback that was made through NSO. The last thing I'm going to show on the device level interfaces here is it was a transaction going out which was all or nothing but we also record that transaction in the form of a rollback so if you've ever filled out a change request which I'm guessing everybody in this call has the first question is what are you going to change and the second question is what if it goes badly how are you going to roll it back in this case I'll pop back to the the UI interface here for just a second and show you what we call our commit manager and our commit manager has the ability to show us all of the changes that have been made and in this case I have a change that was made via CLI and you can see that when I committed it it automatically rendered for me what would the inverse operation be so if I said this interface this change had a negative consequence or something bad happened I can load up the config the rollback configuration and see what it would actually take to roll that back in this case it's as simple as going in and saying no interface loop back six and then I can go ahead and commit that change again here and when we pop back over to the CLI of the device sure enough we should see that now there is in fact no loop back six so that sort of sets us up for the device level uh, interface stuff and gives us an, a sense of what the APIs might look like and what the the single CLI would look like let's let's dive a little bit deeper into um, some of the the challenges that we see um, one of the earliest use cases that customers toward of, sort of gravitate towards with automation is this notion of configuration compliance and governance right which says that the engineering teams create kind of the standard template of what the device configuration looks like um, and from there then we you know push those configurations out to the best of our ability and then over time because we know that changes can be made and the networks very dynamic we need to have a process for how do we audit are those devices actually in compliance with all of the best practice configurations that we've set forth and so on and so forth and so we get this report periodically that says you know so this might not be configured appropriately and stuff like that and then we have yet another policy that says okay well once we get that report how do we go about going back in and making sure that we change the configuration to be back in line with all of those different uh, policies that were set forth and the ones that have drifted unfortunately in a lot of customer environments you know step one and step two are pretty easy to do over time step three becomes more and more difficult and you end up with a lot of different combinations and permutations as the standards have evolved as device configurations of changes have been made and so it doesn't always happen as often as we would like that these devices actually get remediated which is in fact why it ends up being one of the early use cases that customers gravitate towards but that's not really where we want to get to at the end state at the end state what we want is we want those governance policies to actually prevent future out of change compliances and then the whole problem sort of changes shape because if we can prevent out of compliant changes to go in from going into the network then we sort of don't have the problem of how do we audit and how do we remediate devices that have bad configuration on them. So the way that NSO solves this problem is it allows me to create what are called templates and templates are probably very familiar to a lot of folks on this call is sort of what should the device configuration look like and then our compliance report is simply an audit of that template against a set of devices that says okay what is the type of device that that is being rendered here uh, or what, what type of device what does the template say it is and if we're out of compliance meaning that there's something in the template that's missing or too much stuff in the in the device configuration based on what the template is we simply need to reapply that template for the devices that are out of compliance and then finally we can incorporate policies into the configuration database that will prevent non-compliant changes from being made at all through the configuration database and therefore preventing them from from propagating down to the devices and we'll go back to a demo here in an effort to show this I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and we're gonna pop over and show you you know we've said this is the single CLI and single API for the network but you may be sitting there saying well gee whiz he's talked about API and talked about this and that but he haven't actually done anything with the API yet 
So to do that, I'm gonna do a couple of API level operations and we'll, back, we'll kind of flip back and forth and show how those would show up in the CLI. So the first thing that I'm gonna do here is I'm going to provide a API call into NSO via its northbound REST interface that's going to set me up with some device groups, right? And, and I'm gonna create really three device groups, one for all of my devices, one for my iOS devices, and one for my NXOS devices. And, and, and doing this, a couple things to note is that a device can, can be a member of more than one group, and I can in fact nest device groups in other groups. And so it's a, a, a lot of flexibility in terms of, of how you want to organize your devices or how you want to think about we have, you know, using this device group construct in your environment. But when I send that payload here, I get a 204. And you'll notice that in our CLI here, uh, we made a change via REST. It went ahead and told me that somebody made a change. And I can look at my device, device groups. And you see that in fact, here's the CLI representation of all of my devices. All devices has uh, two children, which are the iOS devices and the NXOS devices. And then each one of those groups has a member that is a, a representative of what that platform is. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a configuration template into the device here. And this configuration template says that, hey, we want to have standard DNS servers configured on all of our devices. And so in the case of a I o an NX device, here's the, the data structure that allows the, the DNS server to be configured. And in the case of iOS, here's the data structure that allows the uh, DNS server to be configured. So I'm going to post that and I'll flip back to the CLI one more time uh, and show what that configuration would look like, which is a device template. And again, very straightforward uh, uh, you know, representation of what that looks like. Now, you, you may be asking yourself, well, I'm the network engineer and I know this CLI thing, I can do this, but, but how the heck did you get this XML payload that you posted to uh, the API endpoint? And again, this is one of the niceties of having that single data store and just rendering different interfaces is that if I'm looking at this from a CLI perspective, but maybe I wanna pass over what that payload would look like to a different team that might be using the, uh, uh, you know, maybe the API interface, you know, they wanna integrate this template in with ServiceNow or something, I have several different options for how I can display this configuration. Maybe they wanna see it in XML, in which case I just simply show them the XML output of it and copy and paste that over to them and they can make their API calls. Maybe they prefer to work in JSON. And so I can get the same configuration representation in JSON right from the CLI, pass it over to somebody that's going to be an API consumer and they can load that up as a payload in their API calls. But let's not stop there. Let's move on to the compliance piece of it. So now that we have this template, we can configure a compliance report for, for our devices. And the compliance report is gonna say, hey, take the, the compare template, take the template name which we just created, and audit it against all devices. So this is actually creating the compliance report, and that compliance report can be ran from the command line. So I'm gonna do, uh, first let me show you what we did here, Com show run compliance. And you can see the compliance report, compare template, standard DNS template on all devices. And now to run this, I can do a compliance reports, report, standard DNS, DNS servers configured, and run this report. So it very quickly came out and it said it checked two devices. I can also change the output format of this to be HTML to generate a nice HTML report for myself. And if I copy this URL and push it over into my browser, you'll see that I can pull up the report of what is what are all the changes. Well, in fact, when I did the audit, there was some discrepancies because my iOS device didn't have the name server configured and neither did my NX OS device. So that's the discrepancy. And this is where the, nice, the niceties of the template get applied. So I can come into configuration mode, devices, device, or devices, device group, all devices, apply template, template name, standard DNS. 
And again, it says, okay, everything looks good. I can apply those templates and um, look at what the changes that would actually be made are going to be. So to do that, I would do my commit dry run and look at what the changes are. And here it's actually going to go ahead and add that. I can validate the payload, everything looks good. And then finally I can commit. Now, after I commit, I've remediated the devices. What does that mean? Well, I can run the compliance report one more time and look at what all of the changes are, see if, if in fact now we are in compliant with all the, compliance with all of the devices. And see in rerunning it, we have compliance status, no violation. Now, we don't wanna stop there because as I mentioned, what we really wanna to get to is a scenario where out of policy configuration changes can't be made. And to do that, we'll pop back over to the API one more time, and I'm gonna create a, a proactive policy that says, in this case, you know, and we put a, a lot of comments in here for you to use, and so you can kind of look at this code yourself and, and change it, but the, the nuts and bolts of this, or what I'm saying here is for every device, and more specifically for every device interface that falls into a pattern called gigabit ethernet, which is not shut down, I need to have a description on it. And I can either flag a warning message that says, hey, you need to put a description on this, or I can change it to an error message, in which case it will not allow the commit to be made. So this is, you know, how much of a stick do you want to carry in the automation? Do you want to just tell people, hey, the policy says you need to have a description, or do you want to prevent them from enabling an interface without configuring this? Uh, for this, we'll show, we'll log in here, and I'm gonna actually make sure I ran that, which I don't think I did. And we'll take a peek from the CLI. So show running config. This is what's called a policy object. And the CLI equivalent of it is, here's my XPath expression, any gigabit ethernet which is not shown da shut down should have a description on it. So let's test it. I'm gonna go into config mode here, and I'm gonna go devices, device iOS one and I'm gonna go into config mode and I'm gonna say interface gigabit, uh, I need to do iOS interface gigabit ethernet and I'm gonna do a five slash one and I'm gonna say no shutdown and we'll try to, we'll attempt to now validate this. And it's going to error out, or in this case in the validation saying that interface 5.1 on iOS one needs a description. If I go ahead and commit it here, this is where we're, we're not you know, being super enforcing of it because we're only just giving them a warning as opposed to an error. So I can in fact go ahead and commit and it's gonna again tell me that errors were generated saying that I need a description, but give me the op option to say, okay, well, for whatever reason, this is an exception and I do actually want to proceed with that commit. And we should actually see over here that the, sh the show running config we should have an interface that went ahead and got configured without uh, um, a description. Now, if we did the right thing here in description, iOS interface, gigabit, 6.1, description, I'm a good practice, and now validate this. Uh, it's still going to warn me about 5.1, but no warnings about 6.1. While we're in here, let's go ahead and clean up 5.1 as well. Interface. Exit iOS interface. Gigabit 5.1. Now I'm good. Validate. Ah, now we validated all of our all of our checks have passed, and we can go ahead and commit without any warning. All right, let's flip back over here to the slides. So summing up here, what have we talked about today? We've given you a brief history of TLF and hopefully what you've seen is that this is not a new problem for those guys. They've solved this problem at the device level and through NSO, uh, they've you know said, how do we take those device level problems that we've solved and apply them to a whole network? Because in fact, the problem space is, is a lot more related than you might think. Uh, we've also given you a brief introduction to NSO and how NSO can solve the challenges that you may face in your automation journey. 
uh, a brief introduction to how we break that journey down into three phases, moving from creating a single CLI and a single API to your entire network. Uh, and, and in future sessions, we're going to discuss how we take that single API and then describe the services which we provide from all of the devices in our network. And we've shown you how we solve common configuration and automation challenges uh, um, through policy enforcement and through governance. So we hope you heard, I hope you enjoyed this session. Um, we look forward to your feedback. And with that, Hank, I'm going to turn it over to you if there's no questions. We actually did get one question that came in that I'm hoping you can give us a short answer for. So the, the I'll read it off here. And it's, um, can you compare the capabilities of NSO with other configuration tools like Ansible, Puppet, Shell, Chef, Salt, um, related to both network and non-network domains. And he says, by the way, I see there are many integration initiatives between NSO and Ansible and other tools. So how does NSO fit into these other tools that um, organizations may be looking at? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, which if you've spent any time in this space, you, you, you pr quickly find out that there's a lot of tools out there. And, and a lot of those tools end up having overlaps. The, the thing that I like to think about is that, in particularly when you, when you factor in Puppet and Chef and, and uh, you know, maybe Ansible into that kind of question to scope it a little bit, I, those are great tools and, and I use those extensively on a daily basis. But when I think about the evolution of those tools, those tools have been designed uh, primarily with a use case that involves servers and applications. And, and one of the uh, benefits, I guess, that those teams have, especially in the cloud era, is that you can kind of start with, I've got nothing, I'm going to spin up a new VM, and I'm going to lay configuration down on it. In the network space, particularly in existing brownfield environments, it's not quite that easy because if you walk into a customer and you say, or you walk into your business leaders and you say, tonight at midnight, we're going to right erase the core router and lay down a golden config on it, they, they tend to look at you a little bit funny and, and may question your employment status moving forward. And so what NSO has done is it said, we're going to kind of solve the same problem space of configuration management, but we're going to be exclusively, exclusively focused on what are the nuances of network device configuration management. And so introducing that CDB and other technologies about how do you, you know, what are the different permutations of how you get from a current state to a desired state? And what are the acrobatics of, I've got to do a no form of this command and then add this command and then maybe do a sequence of operations to minimize the impact on the existing network. Those other tools in this space don't actually account for that kind of stuff, and NSO does. That being said, by the you know as as the per person asking the question mentioned, we do see a huge space for integration. In fact, we were at Ansible Fest a couple weeks back, and we told the story about how Ansible and and, and NSO are sort of like peanut butter and chocolate. They go really well together. Because if you're using Ansible in a workflow which is configuring you know, X number of servers and lay down these applications, using NSO, I can abstract all of the complexity of the network and just say, hey, I need a VLAN to run my new servers and my new application on and let NSO handle all of those underlying com complexities. So it provides a really nice separation of concerns uh, for your configuration management across multiple domains. Excellent. That's a that's a really great way to go through it. And I love the the question that's there because it does pull up how important it is when you're thinking about your your automation tooling to remember that that we're the network is just a domain as part of the rest of everything else that's going on and, and ways to connect them together um, works out really well. So all right, with that, so thank you so much, Kevin, for a great session today. I, I get excited every time I hear you talk about NSO because I, I learn something new every, every time it goes through. Um, it really is a fantastic tool for network configuration management, and we're excited to bring the message and the resources out to the NetDevOps Live community that's here. Now, as I believe Kevin mentioned, but we've also been talking quite a bit, NSO is now available for free for anybody to experiment and work with in a non-production um, case. 
Uh, we have a link here on the slide and we've also got that posted up on the website where you can download NSO and go ahead and work with it, run through the same examples that Kevin went through today, explore how it works. So please take a look at that and continue to kind of add that into your tooling journey as you go through. Um, as well as if you want to dive deeper, we've got some DevNet sandboxes that will show you actually using NSO kind of in a larger um, real network tied in with some of the other tools that we've talked about, such as Viral and with PyATS, so you can explore those as well. And as always, we like to uh, kind of challenge our audience at the end of a NetDevOps live session. And so with today's, our example idea here may sound kind of complicated. Build your own network policy using NSO and NetSim. But what we're starting out with is that same code example that Kevin showed for the DNS servers and some of the other pieces. And so take advantage, download the NSO evaluation that's for free up on DevNet, take a look at the code samples and see if you can modify that for some other network policy. For example, NTP server configurations or something like that. And then moving right along, we've got our always available Net DevOps resources up on DevNet. If you're interested in anything going through, the different webinars, the resources, just the discussions that are happening in the community, you can be sure to check out all of the resources that we have on the different sites and blogs and places that are out there. And then finally, we are just closing up. Thank you once again for joining us in this episode for Net DevOps Live. Hopefully you've learned a bit, maybe explored some new tools that are out there, and we will see you in our next one. Thanks everybody.